Well, we begin Acts chapter 2, and what an incredible journey this is going to be. You know, we invested four weeks in Acts chapter 1. Four Sundays just going through the one chapter. Well, when we began to lay out the book of Acts, I had originally allotted one week for, the, for chapter 2. And, you know, sometimes preachers get in a hurry, right? Because there's so much content. I mean, have you ever thought about what it is to preach through the Bible? It's so vast. There's so many topics. There's so much scripture. There's so many things. Sometimes we get in a hurry and we just want to cover the content. Well, the Lord really convicted me about this with chapter 2. And the Lord said, no, 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 Chad. You're not going to, you're not going to blaze through it. You're going to take your time. The Lord wants to speak to us. The Lord wants to do some things. So with chapter 2, what I'm feeling from the Lord right now is we're going to spend four weeks just in chapter 2. Today we're only going to get through half of verse 2. We're going to cover verse 1 and verse 2, and that's as far, I believe, as what we're going to be able to get today. But what the Lord's going to share with us, and I think what God's going to teach us through His Spirit is going to be so special and going to be so helpful. Well, you and I have to be very careful when we study the Bible. We're really when it comes to any topic, but especially when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And the reason why you and I have to be so careful is because we're all raised differently. And what happens is we tend to interpret the Bible based on what we have seen. Does that make sense? So there's some of you listening where you grew up in different style churches, or some of you listening, you never really went to church. We're really your first real church experience. And I love that, and I celebrate that. But for the rest of us, we grew up in all kinds of different backgrounds. And so what happens is, we have a tendency to interpret the Bible based on what we've seen. So take prayer, for example. Some of you, when I say a prayer service, you immediately have in your mind what you think it is. And that sort of determines whether you're interested in attending or whether you have no interest. Right? I can tell you what prayer services were like in the church that I grew up in. We'd all gather up around the altars like everyone would stand in a big semi-circle. And, 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 the, and I had a wonderful pastor, wonderful pastor. But it was very routine. And he would always say, every time, he'd always say, Now, beloved, we're going to redeem the time. And I was a kid, but I knew what redeeming the time meant. I knew it was a verse in the Bible, but I really knew what it meant. It meant for the next 25 minutes... Sister so-and-so was going to share her prayer request. And then for the next 15 minutes, brother so-and-so was going to share his prayer request. And then after we've all stood around the altars for 45 minutes, then that brother and that sister is going to get down here and they're going to try to outpray each other. Have you ever been in churches where they do that? And they try to outpray each other? And it sounds like bumblebees everywhere, you know what I mean? It's just, so when someone says prayer service, I have in my head what that is. And you probably have in your head what that is. And so what we do is we look at something like prayer and we say, oh, I know what that is because I've seen that. Well, is what we saw according to the Bible? Is what we have experienced in our past, is that what God intended in His Word for the church? Because there are different expressions. There are different denominations. There are different ways of doing things. Every church has its own different personality. And so what, what my goal is with this church is to say, okay, we're not going to take something like prayer and make it what I've seen growing up or what other people have seen growing up. What we're going to try to do is go back to the beginning and say, what did God originally intend? You understand what I'm saying? We do the same way with preaching. We say, well, I know what preaching is because I've, I've seen it before. Well, is that preaching according to the Word of God? How many have you seen a lot of preaching that was not according to the Word of God? You know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean, right? We've all seen it. Well, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, nothing can be more true that we have to be careful what our perception is. Is your perception the church you grew up in? Is your perception what you've seen on TV? Is your perception a few experiences that you've had? Or is your perception shaped and molded and founded on God's Word alone? That's my goal. That's my goal. So when we talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit, let's talk about how special that this is. Begin in verse 1. Now, if you remember, the Lord promised that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them, right? 
And now they've been waiting in Jerusalem. And Luke, who wrote not only the Gospel of Luke, but wrote the book of Acts, he, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, he meticulously records for us what is going on. And every word and every phrase is so important. Let's look at it. When the day of Pentecost arrived, verse 1, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what we're going to do, we're going to break this portion of Scripture into two weeks. Today, we're talking about the kingdom experienced Now, what have we talked about so far? We've talked about the kingdom emphasized, the kingdom enabled, the kingdom empowered. We've talked about the kingdom entrusted. Today, we're talking about the kingdom experience. And we're going to call today a mighty rushing wind. Why did the Holy Spirit come as a sound of a mighty rushing wind? There is rich, rich biblical evidence that I'm going to show you today why the Holy Spirit, why God announced the coming of the Holy Spirit in such a dramatic and powerful way as the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Next Sunday, we're going to continue in this. The kingdom experienced a baptism of fire. And I'm going to show you why the Holy Spirit comes as fire and what a baptism of fire is, what the biblical definition of a baptism of fire is. And then the next Sunday, we're going to talk about Peter's incredible sermon. And that's going to be the kingdom evangelized. Oh my goodness. When we read and we study Peter's sermon, the first sermon of the Christian church where 3,000 in one day was converted to Christ. That's going to be special. Then we're going to end the chapter with how after these 3,000 households got saved, not 3,000 individuals, 3,000 households. And when these 3,000 households got saved, they began to meet together. They began to break bread together. They began to fellowship. And we're going to call that the kingdom enjoyed and what real biblical fellowship really looks like. It's going to be a wonderful month, and I think the Lord is going to help us so much in our study of chapter 2. Well, let's begin. Let's try to understand why God chose Pentecost. What was it about the Feast of Pentecost? What was it about this special festival that it was one of the three times that that pilgrims would come to Jerusalem, that God wanted people to come to that holy city to worship Him? What was it about Pentecost that made it so special? Well, I want you to understand. First of all, I want you to know, if you're going to take notes, there are actually seven feasts. Seven feasts that are important to the Lord. One day I was wondering, because actually I was kind of laughing about it, I was thinking, you know, I preach almost every holiday. I mean, you think about all the major like holiday weekends. And, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should ask for holiday pay. I don't know. I'm kidding. But I was laughing about it because I was thinking, because what I'll do is when we plan the year calendar, one of the first things we notice are what are the holidays? What's Mother's Day? And what's Father's Day? And what's Memorial Day? And what's Labor Day? And all of these special Christmas and Easter. And when you go through the calendar and you add 4th of July and you add all of these things, it is remarkable how many holiday weekends there are on our calendar. And I remember thinking to myself one day, I remember thinking, why are we like that? Why are there so many days that are holiday weekends like that? (laughs) Because... See, I'm, I was selfishly thinking because it hurts our attendance, right? So Memorial Day weekend hurts our attendance. Labor Day weekend hurts our attendance. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, Lord, why, why do we do that? Why are there so many weekends like that? And it's just like out of nowhere, the Lord said, you know, Chad, as a people, you get that from me. The Lord, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, listen, there are days that are very important to me. There are feasts, there are festivals, there are holidays, holy days. It's where we get the word holidays. There are holy days that are important to me. Listen to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 37. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, 
which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies for bringing food offerings to the Lord, the burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings required for each day. See, the Bible teaches that the Lord has certain days that really matter to Him. They're important to Him. They should be set aside. They should be observed. And these matter to the Lord. One day, one day we're going to take these seven holidays, these seven holy days, and we're going to do a study on all seven of them and how Christ fulfilled each and every one of them. What we see in the Old Testament and how Christ beautifully fulfilled, we'll touch on it. We'll barely scratch the surface right now because I want you to see why Pentecost mattered to the Lord. Well, Pentecost was actually called the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks. You can, find its, uh, you can find its origin in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16. And, and, and what came before Pentecost was actually something very interesting called the, the, the Feast of, um, of First Fruits. We'll get into this just very briefly. But the goal is, is to show you how these feasts lined up, how Christ fulfilled them, and why when the Bible says that Pentecost arrived or had fully come, your translation may say a fully come. Why, why, why does the Bible say arrived or fully come? Not just indicating the actual festival, but see, do you realize there's been about 1,500 of these Pentecosts up before this point. There's been hundreds, even over 1,000 days of Pentecost. And see, the Lord knew from the very beginning what His plan was, and now the Pentecost. The day that would change history. The day that would launch the church age. Now it has fully come. It has arrived. Every word, every phrase is vastly important. So let's understand this. If you're going to take notes, let me just go over a couple of these feasts so we understand the timeline of what's happening. Christ died on Passover. Now what was Passover? Passover was the time that they remembered the deliverance from Egypt. You remember the story, you go back to Exodus and you see how the Lord delivered His people. Well, what was Passover? This speaks of the redemption of sin, that Christ being the Lamb of God gave His life for us and eternally redeemed us from all of sin, right? Very special. Christ died during Passover. What followed after Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This speaks of removing sin. The the Israelites were to take a week where they took yeast out of their bread. Leaven represented sin, so they would take it out. And what happened? What's this speaking of? There is no sin in Christ. Christ has now removed sin. See, in the Old Testament, sin could be covered, but in the New Covenant, it's washed away. It's gone. It's blotted out. Only Christ, the Lamb of God, had the power to do that. Only Christ can remove our sin. Only Christ can take our sin and throw it as far as the east is from the west. Only Christ can truly remove sin out of our life. It speaks of the removing of sin. It speaks of purging sin out of our lives. What came next was the week of first fruits. This spoke again of their deliverance out of Egypt into the promised land. The Israelites would bring the first of their crops... And see, this would be in great anticipation of the harvest to come. And they would bring the first of their crops. How precious those were. Because what if the harvest failed? How precious of a sacrifice those were. And they'd bring them to the priest, to the temple. And the priest would wave them before the Lord as an offering. And you know what it spoke of? Lord, we're relying solely on you. You're all we have. Lord, if you don't give us harvest, we don't have food. Here is the first of what I have, Lord, and I give it to you. Doesn't that speak of tithing in our own lives? Doesn't that speak of us saying, Lord, here are my resources, and here are my responsibilities. And I don't know if I'll have enough resources to meet all of my responsibilities, but here's what I'll do. I'll carve this out, and Lord, I'll bring it to you as an offering. And I will trust you to meet all the needs of my life. Isn't that special? Isn't that wonderful? And so the, 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 the first fruits, well, it, it speaks much deeper than this. Listen to this. This is what Paul spoke of Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. He says, Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
See, this is the first of the crops of the harvest that is to come. And Paul says, when Christ rose from the dead, He was the first fruit unto God. And all of us who follow, who are in Christ, will follow His example. We will rise from the dead. Amen? We will rise from the dead. I did a funeral uh, for a veteran uh, Friday, and I was riding to Johnson City to the VA with uh, the funeral home director, and he's a great friend of mine, and we're, we're driving. We just got to know each other really well. And he said, Chad, let me ask you a quick question. He said, do you believe in soul sleeping? And do you know what soul sleeping is? Some of you may not know what it is. It's those who believe that when you pass, you stay in a state of, con- of, of being unconscious until the day of the resurrection. And he said, do you believe in soul sleeping? I said, absolutely not. And he said, oh, good, we can remain friends. He was kidding, but, <laughs> but he wanted to know what I thought. And, and he said, well, if you don't mind, let me ask you, why do you not believe in soul sleeping? And I said, well, it's very simple. Because Paul said to be absent from the body is to be, what? Present with the Lord. What did Jesus say to the thief as they were dying on the cross? The thief said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. What a humble thing. What a lowly thing for that thief to say. And what did Jesus tell him? Today, today you will be with me in paradise. See, we believe that the moment you pass, you're in the presence of the Lord. Amen? That's a whole other sermon. That's first fruits. And this leads to the fourth festival, the fourth holy day. What is this? It is Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks is what it's called, or the Feast of Harvest. See, the Greek word Pentecost means 50th, the number 50. It means 50th. And the reason it's called this is because it was 50 days after the week of first fruits. Say, Chad, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, watch what's happened. Christ dies on Passover. Immediately after Passover is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Sin is purged. Sin is conquered. Sin will no more have dominion over God's people forever. It's done. He put him to open shame. Christ triumphed over Satan publicly putting him to open shame. Colossians chapter 2, right? Christ, the Lamb of God, dies on Passover. Immediately is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But when did Christ rise again? During first fruits. Because now He is the first fruit unto the Lord. And when is Pentecost? When? Fifty days after first fruits. Now what's our timeline? What does Acts chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 teach us? Jesus I'm sorry, verse 3, I believe. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus has now presented himself alive by many proofs to his followers. Luke is recording this so that he can prove the authenticity of Jesus Christ. And what does Luke record for us so meticulous? What does he say? For 40 days he spoke about the kingdom. Right? Now what does he tell them? Acts That's Acts 1-3, Acts 1-5, which we've already studied. What did Jesus do? He gave them commands by the Holy Spirit, wait in Jerusalem. And what does the Bible say so meticulously? Not many days from now, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. What's happening? We're in that 40-day, going into that 50-day trial. So this tells us from the ascension of Jesus where he spent 40 days with his disciples, to the time in Acts 1-5 when he told them, you wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit's come upon you. Verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to be empowered. Remember that? Dunamis, dunamite. You're going to be empowered to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And how many days was it? From Acts chapter 1 verse 5 to Acts chapter 2 verse 1. It's a 10 day waiting period. And now on the 50th day, on Pentecost, meaning 50th, on this great celebration of the Lord, now all of a sudden God is going to announce the coming of His Holy Spirit like never before. And what's the difference? See, the difference is the Holy Spirit's always been active on the earth. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment. I'll go back to Genesis and show you how the Holy Spirit's forever been active. 
He's part of the Godhead. He's, 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 he, he is as eternal as God the Father. So yes, he's active. Yes, he's active. But here's the difference. In the Old Testament, Elijah would minister and the Holy Spirit would come upon him. Hannah would pray and the Holy Spirit would come upon her. King David would write psalms and the Holy Spirit would come upon him. Ezekiel would prophesy and the Holy Spirit would come upon him. What's the difference? See, now it's not that the Holy Spirit just comes upon us. He fills us. He indwells us. He resides within us. Is that not unbelievable? See, to a Jew in this day, they would understand. We don't quite understand. They would get it. They would say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're telling me that what God did upon Ezekiel, God will now do for me? Yes. You're talking about what God did upon Jeremiah, God will do for me? Yes. God will lead you. He'll speak to you. He'll guide you. He'll anoint you. He'll empower you. Yes, the Holy Spirit will do all this within you. Isn't that unbelievable? Many of you know we just came through a very difficult season in our church. And I was thinking about this. What if, what if I didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? What if I didn't have the Holy Spirit in the first week of October tell me, Chad, you're getting ready to go through this season. Brace yourself. Get ready because this is coming. What if I hadn't have had that? I would have had no idea what was happening. I would have had no clue what God was allowing. But see, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and He guides us and He anoints us and He empowers us and He strengthens us and He guides us through life. Some of you are doing life. The, whew, you're doing it the hardest way possible because you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. You're not saying, Lord, God, my marriage. Lord, God, my employment. Lord, show me if I should take this job. Lord, show me if I should move here. Show me if we should do this, Lord. Show me what your will is. Lord, speak to me what I am to do. And some of you are doing life the hard way because the Holy Spirit is here to comfort and guide and direct. You understand what I'm saying? He's here to help us. Note, note this. As we begin to go through what little we'll get through in, in verse 2. Well, still in verse 1. They were all together. Now, what does this speak of? Well, I think as it's getting ready to launch the church, it speaks dramatically to the church. And what it says is God will only come to a united church. The Holy Spirit will not come. He will not descend on a divided church. Don't raise your hands, but have you ever been a part of a divided church? Have you ever been a part of a church that was split? You know the pain of that, right? There's one brother in here today that told me he left his church years ago because of the color of the carpet. He didn't leave because of the color of the carpet. He left because everybody was splitting over the color of the carpet. Right? I was with a brother Friday and he was telling me about his church and they had a big church split because they, they were going to build a, a, a gymnasium and half the people got mad and, and split. And they ended up going to a church that had a gymnasium. He said, that made no sense to me. <laughs> You've been a part of church hurts and church splits. W.A. Criswell, that great pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas for decades. He's with the Lord now. What a great model of church leadership he was throughout all his decades of ministry. There was only one time that First Baptist in Dallas almost split. And it almost split. They were having very, very... It was a rough patch of the church. And you know what W.A. Criswell did? He hired a construction company to come in and build kneeling benches behind every single pew of the church. And they came in that Sunday and no music and no sermon. He said, get on your knees. We're going to pray this through. And they prayed their way through. And by God's grace, the church didn't split and God brought healing and God brought grace. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that a great testimony of God's faithfulness? The Lord will only come to a united church. He'll not come to a divided church. And if you and I are going to see God do something remarkable here, if we're going to see God move in our midst as only He can, I'm not talking about man-generated. I'm not talking about God doing something that maybe one of us have, have created or, or strategized or figured out. I'm talking about God doing something that only His Spirit can do. If we're going to see that, we better be united. We better be of one accord. We better have one thing, one purpose, right? 
And you say, Chad, what is that? I'll tell you quickly, prayer. Prayer. That's what the Lord wants his church to do. That's what, did, the, 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 did he not say, my house shall be called a house of prayer? So we know we're doing what's right. We know we're doing what God wants us to be doing. And if you want to get in the flow of what God is doing, if you want to be right there in the flow of what God has happening right now, I'm telling you, it's through prayer. And you say, Chad, I can't be here on Tuesdays. I understand that. Some of you work. Some of you live a long way. But that doesn't mean you can't pray on Tuesday nights. That doesn't mean you can't join the prayer team and take all of these tremendous prayer requests. I mean, I'm telling you, people are... We, we had a girl message us this week who said, pray for my marriage. My husband says it's over, but I'm believing God that he's going to bring restoration. You think that young girl doesn't need all of us praying for her? You think they don't need us calling on God's name? I did marriage counseling with a couple this week on Wednesday that I've never met before. But they know people who go here and they're in trouble. And they called and said, will you help us? Do you not think they need the prayers of God's people? You see what I'm saying? You can be engaged and you can be involved. And if we're going to do, if we're going to see God do what God wants, it's going to take us being in unity and us being together and understanding this is where God's going. Let's jump in it, right? So often we pray for God to bless what we want to do, right? Don't we? We pray, God, God, this is what I've decided, so I'm asking you to help me and bless me. And that's not biblical. What we should do is get in line with what God wants to do and say, okay, God, this is what you're doing. I'm going to be, I want to be about that. And Lord, may you bless your work. Number two, they were in one place. What was this one place? Not only were they together, but they were in one place. Not only were they in unity, but they were gathered in one place. Most likely, it was the upper room. It was the same upper room. Let me rephrase that. We know it was the upper room because of Acts chapter 1. But most likely, it's the exact same upper room where the Last Supper took place in Mark. If you read... Uh, Mark 14 and 15 or Luke 22 and 14. It most likely is the exact same upper room as where they had taken the Last Supper. But see, that's not the point of where it was. Because if anything shocks me in all of church history, it's that they didn't buy the upper room and call it the first church of the upper room. They didn't do that. The gospel went out. It didn't stay in. Blows me away. But the point is, is that they gathered. They gathered. And there's some of you that you gather here. I mean, that's a habit for you. But then there's others where you, you, it's not a habit for you. It's a convenience for you. And you gather when it's convenient. You gather when you feel like it. You gather when, you know, everything is okay enough that you can actually make it down here and you're not too busy. Is that biblical? No, it's not. For God to move, for God to do what He wants to, it requires us gathering. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves, Hebrews 10, 25. Why? Because let me tell you something, when we gather, something special happens, amen? See, you and I have to understand, what's going to sustain weekly prayer gatherings? Not that we're going to come down here and we're going to have these, with these warm fuzzies and it's just going to fill a... No, that's not what's going to sustain it. What's going to sustain it is not music and not preaching and not church. What's going to sustain it is when you and I realize there is not a prayer that we pray that is a waste of time. Every prayer matters to the Lord. Every prayer He keeps and savors. And it matters. It's worship unto Him. And when we have, when we really get in our heads, that every time we gather, something special is going on. Every time we gather, it means something to the heart of God. Every time we gather and we pray, it is, it is supernatural. And it enables the Lord to move. It enables Him to work. What if the disciples had ignored God's command? What if he spoke to them by the Holy Spirit and said, gather? And what, what if they had ignored that? What would have happened? Could the Holy Spirit have come in such power? We must obey God's command. Number three, and I'll begin to wrap it up. He came suddenly. What's this speak of concerning the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit came suddenly. What's this speak of? Listen. Often what God does, He'll do suddenly. Number one, what it tells us, God's, 
the Holy Spirit is not according to our time clocks. Did the disciples know when the Holy Spirit was going to fall? No, they didn't. Did they understand when the Holy Spirit was going to come with power? No. All they knew is God said, wait. And as you wait, the Holy Spirit's going to empower you. And listen, I want to encourage some of you today because you've been believing God for years. Some of you have been believing God for months, some for weeks. I don't care what the time frame is, but some of you have been praying and you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and it feels like all God's doing is waiting and waiting and waiting and you're about to quit and you're about to give up hope. Let me tell you what God will do, He'll do suddenly. Amen? And God's able to work suddenly in our life. And what it tells us is while the Holy Spirit loves and while He serves and while He helps and while He comforts, the Holy Spirit's not our bellhop. He doesn't move when we say move. He doesn't do when we say do. He is not at our service in that way, right? We wait for Him. We say, Holy Spirit, you know what I need. Lord, you know what my church needs. Lord, we need your help and we need your God. Lord, you know all these things that I need. Lord, I am waiting on you. Come in your power, Lord. Come when you're ready and, and help me. That's the attitude that we should have. But don't, don't disregard what he'll do. He'll do suddenly. And see, that's why you and I can't ever... Uh, I think it was John Sable that prayed this morning. Yeah, this is a Sunday in a field of all Sundays, but it's not just an ordinary day. And see, that's these Tuesday prayer gatherings, when we begin... This Tuesday, when we start, we can't, we can't, just, we can't just stroll in here like it's normal Tuesday night because we don't know when God's going to work suddenly. We don't know when God's going to do something. So, we don't know these massive prayer requests that's going out when God's going to respond suddenly. We don't. And that's why the waiting is so important. That's why the faith and the waiting matters to the Lord. Lastly, he came as a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Now notice, it doesn't say that he came as a rushing wind. It says he came as a sound. Why a sound? Why? Why did God choose to introduce the Holy Spirit in such a great way? Such a dramatic way? Well, I think the word sound is quite significant because what does the Bible teach us? Faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Yes. And that's the sound of this mighty rushing wind. And what does wind represent? Well, all throughout the Bible, wind has represented the Holy Spirit. And listen to this. Let me give you just a couple things here. In the ancient languages, Greek, Hebrew, and even Latin, Wind has always been synonymous with spirit. You can even think the human spirit or the Holy Spirit, but wind and spirit have always been synonymous. Well, in Genesis chapter 1, listen to what it says. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. You know what this is? That's the Holy Spirit in creation. The Holy Spirit was the creative Wind, the creative act of God, as God spoke the world into existence, it was the Holy Spirit that was that creative force. The next chapter, Genesis 2, 7, how were we created? The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath, the spirit, the breath of life. See, that's why when we die, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, Earth to earth, yes, but it's our spirit. That's what's created in the image of God. That's what lives forever. That's God, the Holy Spirit in creation. And what did Jesus tell Nicodemus? Unless you're born again, unless the Holy Spirit enters you, the wind will do whatever it wants. Remember how he connected wind to the Holy Spirit? And now here we are in Acts chapter 2. He comes as a mighty rushing wind. What's the point? Here's the point. The Holy Spirit was so active in the physical creation. But see, that's going to pass away. On Pentecost, the 50th, 50 days after Christ resurrected, he was involved in a different creation, and that is spiritual. The church, that will be forever, and that will last forever. So today, if you're here and you're, you're struggling, and you're barely living life right, you, maybe you're here and you say, Chad, I don't even want to think about tomorrow because I don't know if I can handle tomorrow. Let me tell you what you need. You need the Holy Spirit to fill you. You need the Holy Spirit to guide you. You don't need to try to do life 
without the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now next week, we're going to talk about the baptism of fire. We're going to explain what the word filled means. And it's fascinating. We'll go into what the original meaning of filled means. And we'll talk about why the Holy Spirit comes as fire. Michael's going to come. And as he does, I'm going to ask you to pray. And I'm going to ask you what you need from the Lord today. What do you need the Lord to do for you? And whatever it is, I'm going to give you a few moments just to talk with the Lord. It may be your marriage today. It may be finances. It may be job situation. It may be wayward children or wayward grandchildren. I don't know. It may be health. I don't, I don't know. It may be a, a, a major decision that, that, that you're facing right now. I don't know what you're facing. But this is what I know. The Holy Spirit is given to us to guide us and to help us. I'm going to ask you right now to pray and say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Help me in my decisions. Show me what's right. Can we pray together? Lord, we humble ourselves before you. And Lord, if there's anything that I am learning in this season, it's that my strength is not sufficient. It's not, Lord. I'm learning that even when I think I know what to do, I really don't. I'm learning what a blank page is. I'm learning what it means to not have to feel like I'm in control. And Lord, I want to tell you that it has become one of the sweetest seasons of my life. I still get frustrated. I still hit walls. Lord, it's become sweet. And Lord, I want to pray for your people right now, God. I don't know what your people are facing right now, but I know this, that in this room right now, and many more listening online, there are needs that are crushing. And yet you say, come to me and take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. Lord, would you trade some needs today, Lord? Would you take on our needs? Would you take on our heaviness, Lord? Because we don't have the strength. Lord, there are people that, Lord, the decisions that they have to face is is hard and it's tough. Holy Spirit, would you show them what's right? There are some people, Lord, that they are crippled with bitterness. They're absolutely crippled. They can't go any further. They can't grow. They can't get close to you because anger is consuming their lives. Holy Spirit, would you lead them to forgiveness? People have tension. They got frustration. There's sadness, Lord. And there's loneliness. You alone are the answer to these things. You alone have the answers. You alone have the help. You alone, Lord. Why would we look to ourselves? Why would we look to others? It's insufficient. So, Lord, may you help us. May you help us. May you help us.